Well, maybe we can uh, start with a prayer. But before I even do that, I really like the song that the kind of the last of the opening songs that we did. Um, it is well with my soul because no matter what your physical environment is or your physical body is doing to you or what circumstances you are in, it can be well with your soul. And your soul does not have to be um, impacted uh, by your physical being. You can be in the worst shape. You can be going through so much pain. But just as, as, uh, as it has been many times before in other reformers and even maybe in your own life, it's well with your soul, especially when you have a connection with Jesus. Um, so, but it's also really fascinating to note that your soul or your spirit or your, your mental uh, outlook on your life, your paradigm, can really has a tremendous effect on physical outcomes. But it's, it's, it's great to know that we don't have to let our physical surroundings and environment affect our spiritual or mental state. So I, that's what I was really uh, contemplating when that song was being sung. It's well with my soul, no matter the environment. When you're, when you're connected with Christ, that can be true for you. But today, we're going to look at hydrotherapy and, uh, and maybe more ex specifically thermal therapy. So before, in another lesson or lecture or class, whatever, we looked at hydrotherapy and like an overview of many different concepts and ideas that hydrotherapy can confer. But this time we're going to focus more on the thermal aspects. And when I say thermal, hyperthermia aspects. What is heat? What can heat do for the body? Um, and uh, so I'm really not going to touch on cold too much or contrast. I might just do it for concept and proof of concepts and some things, but really it's and researching, and it's just really profound what both uh, aspects uh, can confer to the body. So without further ado, the main, of the main principles that we often um, see in hydrotherapy is contrast. So I, this is just proof of concept. We're not going to uh, um, touch on cold that much. But uh, just to get some basic principles down, get some science behind what you, what you might already know. But the effects of cold on the vasculature tend to um, dilate blood vessels or, or constrict blood vessels. So before I even get that, the intrinsic effect of heat on the body is to increase metabolism, and the intrinsic effect of cold on the body is to decrease metabolism. We're, we're going to go over that more and more, but just like if you add heat to water, it begins to boil, the molecules move faster. Well, it does the same thing in our physiology as well. Um, reptiles, you can think of those. They... If they're out in the sun, their metabolism will get faster. If then they're cold, metabolism gets slower. But one thing that's different with muscle, skeletal muscle that is, it's, it has an opposite reaction. So when you get cold, they're actually activated. It's a fusimotor drive, and they causes you to what? When you're cold, shiver. Exactly. So it's an opposite reaction. So when we put our hands in cold, it still has that reaction. And the smooth muscle, even for the smooth muscle, does the same thing. This muscle that surrounds your vasculature your vasculature. So, um, so we have that constriction effect. And so if we have a dilation when it's warm, when it's hot, like you can even notice this when it's hot out, you don't feel like going out and working hard or something because you don't want to add to that heat. You don't want to generate heat. You want to just keep your body cool. So you have that effect of your vascular well, vasculature as well, dilates the blood vessels and constricts the blood vessels. That's what a lot of people are familiar with, with hydrotherapy. Um, and that is extremely profound. That has huge implications. Actually, your, your skin can actually hold like 30% of the entire blood volume. So the dermis, in the dermis, you've got lots of blood vessels. Holds a lot of blood. And um, yeah, and so that has huge implications as far as circulation is concerned. But the life of the blood is in the creature. Uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? We see this in Leviticus 17, 11, and that truly is true. What kind of compounds are in the blood that are necessary for life? We have oxygen. What other things are circulated through the blood? Glucose, essential fatty acids, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, vitamins, all the nutrients, everything goes through the blood. So without good circulation, you won't have good health. 
If, you, if your blood isn't loaded with the correct properties or things that it needs, you won't have good health either. So you need good blood and you need perfect circulation, as, as this quote um, uh, says. In order to have good health, we must have good blood. For the blood is the current of life. It repairs waste and nourishes the body when supplied with the proper food elements. And when cleansed and vitalized by contact with pure air, it carries life and vigor to every part of the system. The more perfect the circulation, the better will the work be accomplished. Perfect health depends upon perfect circulation. So, speaking of which, a hot compress to the back can increase circulation to the entire back. Actually, a hot compress to the low back increases circulation to the whole whole back and limbs by 156%. So that's pretty uh, incredible. And it has a latent effect. It's not just right when the hot is being applied. So, and also one aspect of hot is it decreases the viscosity of substances. Like when you put honey into a microwave, what happens? That thick becomes more like water and you can shake it around and stuff. Well, same thing with the blood. The blood is actually a tissue and it'll become less viscous. And that just means thick or like, like honey or molasses. So it becomes less that. So if you can imagine pumping that through a regular like trash pump or whatever kind of pump, it's going to work a lot better. So same thing with your heart. So if um, that's happening, it's going to reduce workload of the heart and make it more easy to pass through the tiny capillaries in your body. Very tiny capillaries, so small that a red blood cell has to fold in half to get through. So if you have thick blood, you know, it's going to make it hard to get, you know, oxygen, nutrients to those tiny capillaries in your eye or in your foot or wherever. So really need to have good vasculature to be able to expand and contract. So as I said earlier, the dermis can hold 30% of the total blood volume. Actually, I read research that it's actually higher than that, which is phenomenal. So what is metabolism? Metabolism, the definition is the count, the thing... The thing that's necessary for a cell to maintain its function, all the functions that a cell does to maintain life, those chemical processes, right? So metabolism is defined by, or, but, well, let me just say this. One degree rise in Celsius equates to a 12.5% increase in metabolism. So if you can elevate your temperature by one degree or decrease it by one degree, you're going to decrease or elevate respectively, um, your, your metabolism. So that's pretty significant because if you just go, you know, you know, two degrees higher uh, in Celsius, that is, you're going to be at 24, 25%. Um, so that, and then three degrees, it's, that's significant impact on, on um, metabolism. And actually just these thermal therapies have been used in that, with that in mind, just for, as a, as a, as a therapeutic use for people that can't exercise just to burn more calories and it still has a latent effect and we're going to talk about further on how it actually increases mitochondrial mitochondrial density and i'll say what those are so mitochondrial biogenesis is what that's referred to as but really i'm just kind of going quickly over these foundational physiologic mechanisms so we can get to some really neat studies not that we kind of went over these in a previous um study so Muscle, as I said, is the exception to that increase in metabolism rule. Heat increases metabolism. Well, skeletal, skeletal muscle, it's the opposite. It decreases. And that's why in the hot sun, you just want to do nothing, relax. And then in the cold, you want to shiver. So the rest of your body, the metabolism is slowing. But in your muscles, it's the opposite reaction. Um, so there's that. So water, why water? Water is a phenomenal conductor of thermal energy. It has a high heat capacity, which means it has an incredible ability to store a lot of heat, and then it has a lot of conductive power as well. It can conduct that thermal energy. So, um, and so, so much so that, uh, you know, that's actually how we get a, a calorie, actually. Uh, one degree rise, so a calorie is defined as the amount of thermal energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's what a calorie is. And so if you were to have one gram of water and you wanted to make that 40 degree, one gram of water to 42, it would take two calories, right? So yeah, that's how that's defined. But here's the power in the physical, in the physics of it, is that if you have that one gram of water that is 
99 degrees Celsius and you want to turn that into 100 degrees, you know, how many calories would it take? You might think just one, right? No, it's actually 540, depending on atmospheric pressure and a number of things. But it's a lot more calories that are going in. So when we are subjecting the body to thermal stress through whatever means, in, in a hyperthermia bath, that would be water, um, that's a lot of energy going into that body, into that person. A lot of calories going into that. Not literally calories, but a lot of the body has to burn that many calories. Thermal energy. And so, yeah. The body is really working hard. Um, so, yeah. So, how about you take calories? Yeah, so does it take calories? Uh, you started to say a question, so I, want, I can't really rephrase it for the mic, but I understand. So, yeah, you can't, you don't add calories to uh, cool something down. It's taking away calories. So, energy cannot be created or trans, it's only transformed. Yeah. has to burn so many calories to warm themselves back up. Absolutely, yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, brown tissue or brown fat and um, other thermal thermal genesis activities such as shivering. Yeah. I don't know if I fully understood your question, but I, I think it'll become more clear as we go. So vascular compliance, which I alluded to, is the the ability of one's vasculature to be able to adapt by... Um, I always get this wrong, my hand motions, they don't match what I'm about to say, but constrict or dilate. That's what vascular compliance is. And if you have a low vascular compliance, you do not constrict or dilate depending on what your body is wanting to do at that time. You don't do it sufficiently. So if you're working out very intensely or something and your legs need lots of, lots of oxygen and your heart needs lots of oxygen, you would want your uh, capillaries or your vasculature to dilate. However, if you have a sedentary lifestyle or not very good vascular compliance, that's not going to happen. And then somebody might get a, um, a heart attack or if it's in the brain, a stroke or, or feel very fatigued. That's all it may feel because if your, your blood, your, the oxygen is not getting to where your, your muscle, your femur, and, um, vastus lateralis, medial lateralis, all those muscles that are working, right, then you're just not going to be able to produce. So you, that's, that can be a sign of fatigue as well, just not being able to get the glucose or the, um, or the oxygen to the area to be able to create that ATP to be able to do muscular contractions, right? So those things, vascular compliance is hugely central to, um, to, to actually, the CDC did a big study where it said that the leading actual cause of death worldwide was hypertension. And key to hypertension is the loss of vascular compliance. So anything we can do to help vascular compliance, essentially gymnastics of the blood vessels, is going to help on health all around. Um, because why it's so essential is because, you know, everywhere in your body needs oxygen, glucose, blood, blood flow, essentially. So if that is compromised, everything else is going to be compromised. So it's huge. And uh, while we're augmenting or manipulating the vasculature through hydrotherapy, we're doing that when you get in hot water or in a thermal environment or go into a cold or a contrast, you're really dilating and constricting, really moving that vasculature. That in and of itself is beneficial, just like stretching is essential. We don't often think of stretching for our vasculature. But not only that, it actually any kind of manipulation of those endothelial cells, um, which line the medial or the inner side of the of the, the blood vessels, actually secretes nitric oxide. So just massaging your skin even, um, that's why massage is so good for lowering blood pressure, not only just feeling more relaxed and relieving that tension, but literally you're increasing nitric oxide circulation. And nitric oxide is the key blood pressure lowering compound or chemical in our body. You may have heard of, um, you might have heard of uh, nitroglycerin. Who's ever heard of nitroglycerin? Yeah, people take that if someone having a, a heart attack or something. It's a vasodilatory. We used to give it um, to uh, while I was working as an EMT. Someone's complaining of chest pain. Well, our body can actually make the the root chemical where they got that from of itself. Actually, a lot of these medications and chemicals were discovered just by looking at 
physiology and then saying, how can we recreate that? Or how can we make something like that to have that same effect in that pathway? So endothelium, uh, endothelial cells produce nitric oxide and the just manipulation of them causes nitric oxide to be secreted. So that's huge as far as vascular compliance and increasing that ability. And it has a latent effect. So obviously when you put, you expose your hand to hot water, the blood vessels are going to dilate. But yet it has a latent effect because we've just stretched those muscles, but then also the nitric oxide. And it's found to be uh, much longer. Another study that I'll reference. No, I'll just wait till we get there. It's really neat. It has a, a real serious latent effect, meaning that it's, it lasts longer than the actual therapy. Yeah. So, so here's one, one of the biggest probably studies with thermal therapy. If you'll notice, it says sauna bathing, but really a lot of these treatments, they might have different um, sources of heat, but they're acting on many of the same uh, physiologic principles. And we're going to see that. So you, different studies will have different sources of heat, but a lot of the same physiologic principles are the same. And the more you dig into it, the more you'll see that. There are slight variations, which we'll talk about. But the largest ongoing study on saunas or thermal therapy is in Finland. They're very crazy about their saunas. If you've done any like research into it, you'll, you'll know that. Yeah, all the Nordic countries. Yep. They even say like, uh, oh, I think it's for every two people, there's one sauna or every three people, there's one sauna. It's, it's very high. And, uh, and um, it counteracts a lot of their environmental, uh, like lack of sun and other things and cold. I think this is what really makes them a thriving area of the world. I don't quite know why they're not a blue zone, actually. But um, I think this is a big part of that. So this is over 3,000 people that are, it's an ongoing study, prospective study, and they've been following these people for 20 plus years, some 25 and 27 years. So it's a nice study where we can draw some good correlations. So um, there's a study where they took three groups, actually all in all these 3,000 uh, population study, 3,000 people are in there and they are in three groups. And they're in three groups um, because it's groups based on how often they use the sauna. And in this study, they, it's mainly a cardiovascular study, cardio, yeah, all things cardiac. Um, and they wanted to see what is, how it's helping with cardiac outcomes. And so there's three groups, those that use the sauna two to, well, one time a week, two to three times a week, and four to seven times a week, okay? And, um, and they all use it at different durations as well. And so they, they tried to calculate for that too. And all of these individuals have at least one cardiac risk factor, okay? But here's a, you know, in reviewing the study. So sauna use, those who use it two to three times per week had a 22% lower risk of um, a sudden cardiac death risk. So 22%, just two to three times per week. And, um, and this was a mixed use. Some were using it for 20 minutes and some were only using it for five minutes. So even with that large variance, we have this uh, 22%. So those using it four to seven times per week had a 63% lower sudden cardiac risk. And this is both compared to those using it only one time per week. So I wish we could compare it to those who weren't using it at all, because this would be a dramatically larger. But this is, this is compared to those using it one time a week, because there was only three, uh, three groups in, in, the, uh, in the study, not a control that was doing nothing. Um, so that's fascinating. And they, and they accounted for um, uh, other factors, that confounding factors such as socioeconomic status, education, um, other, other risk factors. So they, they um, what was the word I'm looking for? They accounted for those uh, factors to make it applicable to you and I. So in that same study, they also looked at um, uh, coronary heart death or disease deaths, so deaths surrounding coronary heart disease. So those who use the sauna two to three times per week had a 23% reduction, which is incredible. And then sauna use four to seven times per week, 43% reduction in coronary heart disease or coronary heart disease death. And then those who used it more, two to, uh, oh, I had those backwards actually. Yeah, anyway. So it's a clear dose dependent effect. So the higher the dose, the, the, the greater the effect. Now, obviously, there is a limit to that, 
um, and we might be able to get into that maybe in question and answer time and the ap application of things. But um, from what all the studies are showing, it's a dose-dependent effect. Mm -hmm. Did I hear something? Okay. So one of the main mechanisms that are being stimulated, um, there's so many, but one of them, uh, during this heat shock or this thermal shock or thermal stress is heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are fascinating proteins. They're like, they're amazing. They're upticked or triggered to be able to protect cells inside the body. They're chaperone cells, if you would, or what they do actually is they, well, I should take a step back. Cells, for a cell to be able to function, it not only needs to be in the right genetic sequence, right? the right pattern, the right code, but it also needs to be in the right shape. They're a 3D dimensional, 3D dimensional uh, protein. And so if it's in the right genetic sequence, that's great, but it could be degradating and misfolded. And so what heat shock proteins do is they go around and see that and say, ooh, you're not folded the way you should be. And so they actually refold that protein, or if they say, oh, it's too far gone, let me just scrap you all together, bind to you and cause some macrophages to come in get rid of you or, re, you know, phagocytosis to be able to recycle those amino acids and such and make a new protein. So heat shock proteins are phenomenal. They, uh, yeah, they, they, they actually will even bind to tumors and become cytotoxic to that tumor and call lymphocytes or natural killer cells or killer T cells to come and kill that tumor, which we'll get into further as we go. So it, it's pretty remarkable. But, um, uh, they're upregulated uh, with thermal stress here. And um, let's see, look at these. They activate receptors of the innate immune system. We'll get into that more so. They provide functions essential for maintaining protein, protein homeostasis. We've kind of talked about that. And they're upregulated in heat stress. So heat shock proteins and hyperthermic conditions. How do we get all the effects of heat shock proteins? Well, heat shock proteins are stimulated when we just go a few degrees in Celsius above our normal um, body temperature. And so that's pretty remarkable. That's achievable. And it's, a, it's a, on a spectrum. It's not like once you're at this point, then they're activated. No, the further elevated in temperature you go, the more pronounced or the more activated they are. Because they're designed, because proteins need to be, like the harder they get, they don't function as well. So God gave a mechanism so that if we're really working hard in the sun or if we're in a high heat environment and proteins are starting to degradate and dysfunction and aggregate and stuff, well, God gave us a mechanism to be able to fix that and resolve that. Well, we can trigger that mechanism without being in a dangerous hyperthermia situation. So you may think, oh, if that was a safety mechanism, we don't want to. No, we can trigger that, kind of trick your body in a way to stimulate those without being in a dangerous environment. So that's really exciting. Um, do I say it here? Let me just go ahead real quick. Yeah, I do say it there, so I won't say it now. So heat shock proteins. After healthy men and women sat in a heat stress chamber for 30 minutes at 163 degrees Fahrenheit, their level of heat shock protein 72, there's a big family, it's a big family of proteins, um, increased by 50%. There's a picture of a guy running there. They weren't running. That was just the best picture I could find of a heat stress chamber. They were just sitting in it. Their heat shock protein, his heat shock proteins are a lot higher because he's working out and he's in that hot environment. Um, we're also going to find out in another study that the, a lot of the benefits of thermal therapy or hyperthermia or a lot of different names are akin to that of exercise. So it's, it's very similar. It's actually the same as moderate to intense exercise, depending on how hot the body's getting. We're going to look at that. But by 50%, that's remarkable. And then another study, men and women, 45 to 38% respectively in heat shock uh, proteins elevation. Um, yeah. Is it, possible? Is it possible to pass out when you're exercising and in your environment that's that hot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. And you have to, um, because you're, you're in a hot environment, blood vessels are very dilated. So you're getting your the limited, you have a set fixed amount of blood in your body. So if that's all going to the skin, well, where is it not? <laughs> it's not in your, your head. So that's why people faint. That's why, uh, the brave young man soul here, he fainted while he was preaching 
I think the devil is also attacking him, but also the nerves and stuff and just lack of blood in the brain causes one to faint. So yeah, definitely something to be aware of. Um, and that's why we want to keep the head cool. Well, it sounds counterintuitive, but that's for a different reason. Um, but as, when we go to the more practical aspect, there's things that you can do to mitigate that or if it does happen to protect from it getting dangerously serious. So another aspect that is really neat that heat uh, infers on the body is it increases mitochondrial biogenesis. And that sounds like a big thing, but biogenesis uh, just meaning that it's creating something. It's creating more mitochondrial. So just exposure to heat increases. It doesn't say the, the heat, how much heat it was, or I don't have it written down probably in the study, but how much heat increases mitochondrial biogenesis by 28% compared to the baseline. So what are mitochondria? Mitochondria are the cells that produce the energy currency of the body, adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate is what drives all of your muscular contractions, or it's the energy behind it. Works with acetylene choline and calcium and other things, but it's the actual um, energy molecule where it becomes diphosphate under the release of that. So just exposing yourself to heat increases that. Similar to exercise. While you exercise, you place a demand on your body. And if you're exercising enough or uh, to a point where you're pushing yourself to where you're showing your body that what you have, the energy creating capacity that you have currently is not sufficient, that says, all right, we need to create some more mitochondria. So we can, if this guy's going to continue this, we need to be able to sustain uh, those levels of energy. And so when you do that with exercise, your body creates more mitochondria. We know that. What we didn't know until recently is that just exposing yourself to heat increases mitochondrial density. And when you increase mitochondrial density, you have a latent effect of having more energy because if you have more factories that are producing and utilizing fat and glucose and glycogen to produce energy, ATP, then, uh, then you're going to be burning more calories, but also you have more energy at your disposal. So that's why when you exercise, people like who are real sedentary don't feel like doing anything, but when they start exercising, they feel so good. They feel like they have so much more energy now. A number of reasons are in play there, but largely due to the mitochondrial density. Lactate going to the brain, the, the, they can use lactate as fuel too, so your brain even feels so much uh, better. Another thing that increases um, blood fluidity and the hemodynamics of it is water. This will really decrease the viscosity of water. Let me demonstrate. So all you have to do, it really helps your heart. You don't even need to be in a heat chamber for that. So mitochondrial density is increased. Um, so dysfunction of these heat shock proteins can, um, can cause a lot of different things. Um, you may have heard of Alzheimer's disease and uh, beta amyloid plaques. Anybody heard of those? It's kind of a hot button topic right now. But... Beta amyloid plaques are when the proteins are dysfunctioning or aggregating and clumping together, okay? And then they're kind of blocking, this is putting it rather crude, okay? But they're blocking the, you know, the synaptic tra uh, transmission of, did something change or is it just, okay, I thought it sounded different. But along that axon, there's a blockage uh, of so that acetylcholine or other neurotransmitters can't get through. And so they're blocking um, that neurotransmission. So that aggregation actually blocks synaptic transmission. And so leading to Alzheimer's. And then Parkinson's, which is a similar story. It's an aggregating of proteins along the axon or somewhere in the neuron, which doesn't allow the signal to go through. And with Huntington's disease, it's the same thing. It has Huntington's protein or, or the gene for that. It's just aggregating and collapsing. So we have a, a protein that actually fixes that. It's called heat shock proteins. They find, oh, there's aggregating proteins. Well, let's bind to those and either repair them or get rid of them altogether. So heat shock proteins really do that. And actually, um, UCSF, I think is what it's called, University of California, something. They have um, there's Ashley, I think, I forget her last name, not my wife, but a scientist there that's actually looking and using heat shock proteins or hyperthermia treatments to treat cancer, uh, well, yeah, that too, but Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease and Parkinson's, these neurodegenerative diseases, because it's utilizing the heat shock proteins to fix those or get rid of them and 
Is the, that, that hyper nature. or hypo? Hyper. Did I say hypo? No, you said hyper. And I just okay. Yep, hyperthermia because we want to increase the heat shock protein levels. And as we said, you know, 170 or 169 increases by 50 percent. And that was just a, I think in that study was just a 15 minute exposure, and that lasted several days. It's beyond 24 hours. Yeah. Um, so these are strongly implicated with Huntington's disease and these neurodegenerative diseases, which is, has profound effects. And obviously, the sooner one can do this uh, in life, the, the more pronounced the effect is going to be at uh, pushing away or, or even reversing whatever disease. But speaking of brain health, uh, a warm water immersion bath actually increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor and, um, and reduces concentrations of cortisol. Cortisol is that, that stress hormone, that fight-or-flight hormone, that, that stuff that constricts blood vessels and, and uh, you know, constricts, uh, dilates the pupils depending on a variety of things. But brain-derived neurotrophic factor, what that is, is actually that's a, a, a factor that protects neurons and if neurons are not functioning correctly it induces them to repair themselves and induces actually heat shock proteins to come in and repair that neuron and it's it's a it's a a factor that actually just encourages neurons to regrow themselves and to generate new neurons we used to think that neurons were set you had them once in life and then if you lost any after 25 then you didn't get any more but that's not true they're they're always regrowing and and uh, repairing themselves. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor is associated with longevity because there's what that's the factor that is maintaining the health of your neurons. Yeah. So you were mentioning Alzheimer's and Huntington's chorea. Um, is that like all neurodegenerative diseases? Like even, um, uh, I think what your mom had, ALS? Okay, so I can't speak to any, I, from a literature standpoint, I can't speak to... ALS specifically, but Huntington's disease, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's were all looked at specifically. But any, of, I would imagine that all these other neurodegenerative diseases would be affected to a greater or lesser extent because it's the aggregation of these proteins, or or um, proteins just not falling, not um, not working appropriately. So heat shock proteins are there to assess whether it's in good working order, whether it's folded correctly, or right genetic sequence, or and it corrects the mutations if it needs to be corrected, or if it's too far gone, it causes it to commit apoptosis. Or so, yeah. So in all of these neurodegenerative uh, diseases, it has a positive effect. So I would imagine that it would, but I can't speak from a literature standpoint. Yes. Immersed in the warm water for it to be beneficial. Yeah, very good question. So does this study mention how long you need to be in that warm water to get the function? So um, this particular study that I mentioned right there was a uh, reviewing practices that people are already doing it. So it's not, they had been doing it for a while. So it's, it's not, a, they can't see, um, this is not a causal correlation. They're just saying, this is what's happening. This is a physiologic effect. So no, I can't, the study didn't say that. However, um, However, there is a causal relationship with hypertension because we can know that because when one person goes into a sauna just for 19 minutes and they come out, they have decreased lower blood pressure immediately. They have high blood pressure and then they have a reduction in their blood pressure immediately. No other lifestyle factor is being um, affected, right? So that's a causal relationship and it's being affected for up to a week after. It's not just that very moment. They have a lower blood pressure, clinically lower um, uh, measured by their baseline before and then uh, in a hyperthermic event and then after it is lower sustained for up to a week after so that's pretty remarkable that's that's a clear causal relationship but this is more of a mechanistic what I'm saying it's a mechanistic relationship where we have a clear mechanism and it's shown to work but we don't know that like it wasn't a, 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 a placebo controlled study more of a correlative study and prospective study but to say that I don't have it on here, and I've referenced it twice, and I should have put it on here. But this, this um, UCF, UC, UCLF, somebody knows it. In California, they have a they have an ongoing research department where they're actually putting people in hyperthermic conditions with their head out of the thermic environment so that they can do a prolonged treatment um, because that's the limiting factor, uh, and we'll get into that later. Um, 
and they're treating insomnia, they're treating depression, and they're treating these neurodegenerative diseases. And so it's an ongoing clinical study that's happening right now, which will be able to answer that question. But we know the mechanism, and the mechanism is favorable, and we know that it's favorable, and we know that it helps. So it would be safe to say that, you know, we just, I just can't say that how much or how long. And yeah. So, all right. FOXO3 proteins are very similar to heat shock proteins, but they work more uh, the expression of genes. And they express the longevity genes is what, what they're called. But they do a lot of cellular maintenance and their chaperone functions as well. And they're protecting um, uh, uh, against degradation of proteins. I'm just going to just, they work with sirtuin 6, sirtuin 1 to have these effects. Okay. But we want to get to fevers. So we have kind of a baseline of what hyperthermia treatments do to the body, what hyperthermic stress can do. Now let's apply it to more of a fever state, right? Um, so fevers are physiologically beneficial. A lot of times people have the perspective that they're not beneficial or that it's a scary thing. And a lot of times people think that a fever is caused by the infection. And it, in a way it is, but actually the, but the, the fever is a response the body has to infection. So it's a little different of a perspective, but it's, it's, it's significant. So it's not that the, um, it's not that something outside is coming in and causing this to your body. It's something's coming in and your body's response to it. Okay. And we're going to look at why that is. And some people are very scared of, uh, fevers and they call it fever phobia. And this is, um, medical professionals and the general public scared of fevers, but it's, it's this study saying there's really no need for that. It's very beneficial. It's a design my perspective or in their perspective, an evolved uh, mechanism to enhance our survival, right? But um, fevers are physiologically beneficial. Back in the day, uh, neurosyphilis, which is a real bad bacteria and uh, causes all sorts of bad things. Actually, your just brain just eats your brain apart. But how they used to treat it was they used to inject some malaria or plasmodium malaria to induce a fever. So they were inducing this fever with a different bacteria, um, but they were treating neurosyphilis effectively because they were inducing a fever. So I'm just saying that the fever is a good mechanism. I don't recommend overcoming evil with evil. I rather overcome evil with good, not putting something negative or detrimental in your body. But this is just showing proof of concept that inducing this fever even cured many, many cases of neurosyphilis. And even um, back in the day, it was, it was referred to as Coley's therapy. They would even do that to treat cancer. That's pretty significant because we're going to talk about that. We can treat cancer even um, without having to induce a fever through injecting something that's not necessarily favorable, like a bacteria of some sort. Um, and, and a lot of these treatments or a lot of these studies, uh, they need to look at you know, either rats, mice, humans in a hyperthermic environment. And they'll do that in a number of ways. They'll either put the subject in a heat box or in a bath or whatever, or they'll inject something into them to create a hyperthermic environment due to a fever response. And they'll put like a lipopolysaccharide or different thing that'll stimulate an infection. In this case, it's not the full um, plasmodium malaria. It's just the, the, the membrane of it. And a lipopolysaccharide is just the, the, the outer shell of whatever that is. But it's still evil. It's still not necessarily something that your body wants, which is why it induces this fever response. Seth? Yeah, I was just going to say, when uh, we used to work at Poland Spring, yeah. uh, we would keep a cold cloth on their head and try to elevate their body temperature. I think it was to 106, but their head temperature, we didn't want to get above like 103, 104. Yeah. And so you could keep ice on their head and get their body temperature up. And we, we, that's how we fought cancer. Absolutely. Yeah. It has a number of effects. Um, I would actually, yeah, I'd like to oral temperature. We'll talk more about that, but the, the, the neurons in your brain are very sensitive to temperature, way more sensitive than the rest of our body. And so actually at around 106, 107, 108, it, you know, it's not hard concrete. They actually really begin to degrade and dysfunction and just die. And you don't really want that happening in your brain because uh, that's, that's where a lot of important things go on and uh, some people more than others. But, um, and so, <laughs> so yeah, we try to stay away from those high numbers, but that's the idea. Keep the brain cool, but allow the rest of the body to um, elevate its temperature for all the previous mentioned mechanisms. So another question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So that's pretty, that's, that was a good proof of concept there. So fever mechanisms, how this works is really cool. Um, you have a place in your brain called the hypothalamus and uh, your hypothalamus is what kind of sets your temperature in your body or works to that. And you have an area in your hypothalamus, which is called the ventral medial preoptic area. And in that area, there's lamina terminalis. It's in the quiz, so write this down. You have lamina terminalis, which actually is outside of the blood-brain barrier. So obviously, your hypothalamus is in the inside the brain, away from the rest of the, uh, you know, the body circula circulation-wise. But it has a part that's outside of the blood-brain barrier. What is the blood-brain barrier? I should say that. It's a part that protects the brain from all the pathogenic material and other things that are circulating in the body from going actually into the brain. So it, it's a, a layer of defense, a level of defense to keep infection out of the brain. But we have this area in the brain that regulates and, and generates and, and affects, controls fever and stuff. So the lamina terminal analysis is outside of the blood-brain barrier. And so it has uh, receptors on it that actually... Um, uh, will sense if there is an infection. So it'll sense that if there's immune activity or immune cells or, um, or even pathogenic material itself and says, oh, this is not good. And so it will mount a fever response to that. And actually what will happen is your hypothalamus will set the body temperature lower. It does a variety of other things, but it sets your body temperature lower. So you're what, 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. And that's, that's where you feel comfortable. But it actually will say, oh, now we are, even though you are physically 98.6, we're going to say you are 95 or 94. And now all of a sudden you feel cold, although you are the same temperature. So it just, it's a hypothalamus and that's how it, it tricks your body in a way to say, let's generate heat. And it does it in a number of ways. You shiver, you get these cold chills, right? Um, when you're having a fever and you shiver and that's one way to generate heat, but also he actually stimulates your brown fat. Anybody heard of white fat, brown fat, and there's different purple fat? That's purple, blue fat. If you punch somebody really hard, you get purple and blue fat. But, <laughs> um, but no, there's something called brown fat and, and white fat. And the difference, that the, what, the reason why there's difference is one has more mitochondria in it. So brown fat has more mitochondria. Why it's brown is because of mitochondria have a lot of iron in it. And so that's why it looks more brown under a microscope. Yeah. And so it, it stimulates, the hypothalamus stimulates these fat cells, adipo, adipocytes, to produce energy, start metabolizing. And that elevates the temperature. This is probably the only thing I'll say about cold exposure, cold therapy. If you routinely expose yourself to cold environment, you increase your uh, brown fat levels. So you're increasing your mitochondrial density in your brown fat, which makes you more able to um, uh, acclimate to cold environments. So am I, that, that's pretty significant. If you are somebody that's routinely cold, um, there's a number of things you'd want to look at, like circulation and stuff. But also, if you actually expose yourself more intentionally to cold, you'll adapt to that by increasing your mitochondrial density inside of your fat. And that's actually going to be better for metabolizing and consuming calories. Um, so if you have, if you want to have, you want to lose some excess weight, might be an approach to look at. But um, yes, that's yeah, cryotherapy, cold use of cold as therapy. Yeah, like these polar plunges or other exposures to cold, specifically and intentionally, not just being outside and cold. But yeah, yep, yeah, that would definitely do it. Increase your mitochondrial density in your fat cells, and it becomes brown fat, which actually is way more beneficial because um, it can help help to elevate your temperature, consume calories. Yeah, it's not just fat. It's got a function to it. So as you can see in that picture, so there's, it in, induces thermogenesis through brown fat and through shivering. And that's how we get our fever. Now, what is the fever doing? Well, because we increase metabolism generally, like heat, what is the intrinsic effect of heat? Increases metabolism, right? So that's increasing the cellular functions that all the chemical processes that happen within a cell in order to maintain that cell. Well, that's also happening with white blood cells. White blood cells are, you know, we know what, what white blood cells are. They help to combat different diseases, and infections and stuff. So the innate immune system is the part that first goes out and finds the infection or it's kind of always out there. I kind of like to, I've heard it mentioned this and I think it's accurate, but um, like the police system, our police system has many flaws, but it also does a very great, it, I'm glad it's there, okay? But they're out patrolling and stuff, just like the 
uh, innate immune system, the dendritic cells and the um, lymphocytes, they're out patrolling, right? And when it senses something, the, the enzymes or uh, just uh, as they're fighting that, parts of it go up to this, the, uh, the part of the hypothalamus that is outside of the blood-brain barrier, and it triggers a response there, and then we get our fever, and, and then the fever increases the metabolism of those immune sites, of those dendritic cells, of those lymphocytes, of those. So they're working harder. But not only that, the fever is the signal to cause other white blood cells to come out of the lymph nodes where they're kind of housed, like the army barracks or maybe the uh, Coast Guard, no, it's the army reserve, to come out and fight that bacteria as well. So not only is the fever calling, recruiting more soldiers or more white blood cells to the action, it actually is causing them to work more because we're increasing their metabolism, increasing the rate at which they're going to uh, phagocytize their whatever or do their cellular burst with reactive action, oxygen species or whatever it is. Okay. Also, heat increases the, uh, um, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. So uh, impact of febrile, febrile temperatures on innate immunity. So this is the first responders. Previous research using animal mod models of hyperthermia treatments alone strongly support the idea that fever range temperatures elevates the respiratory burst typically associated with activation and bacteriolytic activity in neutrophils. So it's increasing the neutrophil's ability to um, kill pathogens. And that's, they actually like, it's kind of like a cough that they do. And they cough up live, you know, not live, just oxygen reactive species. And that just kills them. Or if they do it with bleach of some sort or yeah, a variety of ways, whatever their mechanism, it upticks it. Um, impact of febrile temperatures on innate immunity, thermal stress further increases neutrophil recruitment to local sites of infection. So just the elevated in temperature recruits them specifically to the infection. That's kind of obviously because they're sending out signals and they're saying, hey, it's over here, it's over here. So they're going to locate there. Um, and also not just to the site, but also to tumors as well. So so elevating the temperature again, not only heat shock proteins are binding to the tumors and committing other cells to be cytotoxic to that tumor, just the temperature itself is going to do that. Whole body hyperthermia substantially increases the rate of neutrophil recovery. So the rate at which not all, so a lot of the pus that you see around a cut, that's dead white blood cells um, that, have, that have died in combat, you could say, you know, um, or their enzymatic processes there. Uh, but not all white blood cells have to die. And actually increasing the temperature, they can be recovered. It's like help, like a hospital for the veterans. I don't know. It actually helps them to recover, and they can get back into action. So it helps their recovery, and it also helps from a stem cell function uh, standpoint uh, in the bone marrow. They're producing more neutrophils. So this is all produced by heat therapy or heat shock. Um, so increase in temperature. They're working harder. They're recovering better. And from a stem cell function, we're producing more of those white blood cells. It's pretty incredible. Um, the progenitor cells within the bone marrow, that is. There's, and then they develop into neutrophils or whatever is needed. Um, immune stimulation by thermal stress. It has been shown that natural killer cell cytotoxicity, uh, cell cytotoxic activity and recruitment to tumor sites is increased in fever range hyperthermia. All right. That's We've seen that a number of times. That's something that's important when you're researching science and stuff or, you know, want to find something about health. You want to see it consistent in a variety of different areas and a variety of different mechanisms before uh, you don't want to just, just like the word of God, if you see it just right here and only here and it, maybe, maybe that's not necessarily accurate. But if it's all across here a little, there a little in the word, that's, that's what you want to build your faith on. Um, so immune stimulation by thermal stress. Macrophages have served as a major model for the study of febrile range hyperthermia. Studies demonstrated that whole body heating is uh, 39.5 degrees Celsius. That would be what? That would be like 103.5. Uh, improves bacterial clearance significantly. So just getting that bacteria out of the body through whatever mechanism. So it increases that. Hyperthermia induces the upregulation of uh, heat shock protein 70. We looked at heat shock protein 72 earlier, and this reprograms macrophages to show sustained activation in response to lipopolysaccharides, which is something that they use to activate that fever. So what it does, the heat not only um, 
causes the, their metabolism to work more, but it induces heat shock protein 72 to make them more sensitive to pathogens. So it's like not their job is specifically to become cytotoxic or, or to get rid of this pathogen, but then the heat stress causes heat shock proteins to make them even more sensitive to that, That's, which is rather incredible. Um, fever enhances dendritic cells, part of the immune system, innate immune system. And I'll just keep going. Uh, heating of immature dendritic cells also upregulates their expression. Okay. And they just become more powerful at uh, finding um, the pathogen, whatever that is. So this is really neat. Lymphatic lymphocyte trafficking. Febrile temperatures act on lymphocytes and high endothelial cells to improve lymphatic trafficking exclusively across high endothelial venules. So um, you have your innate immune system, which is circulating first responders, but then it usually takes about a week before you adapt a, uh, um, what's the other one? Innate and adaptive <laughs> immune system. And um, that adaptive immune system, how it becomes adaptive is it as, as the innate immune system is bringing and destroying that pathogen, it goes through the lymph nodes, lymph nodes. And in the lymph nodes is where the killer T cells are seeing that bacteria or pathogen or virus or whatever. And they're saying, okay, how can we best fight this in the future? And they, they create specific killer T cells for that specific antigen, right? Like antigen and antibodies. So that's where that happens in the lymph nodes as it's traveling. So the endothelial venules are around in the lymphatic system. So it's increasing the traffic through there, which means that they can mount, they can create specific natural killer T cells uh, to that specific antibody or to that specific pathogen, antigen, I guess. So it's increasing the, the education in a way. So actually what they found is it usually takes about a week for you to create an uh, um, adaptive response. But with heat therapy, because of the increased traffic through the endothelial venules, it's much uh, quicker. So you can create that adaptive immune system on a much shorter if you're inducing this hyperthermic event, which is pretty incredible. So just getting something that's uh, like your infantry that just goes out and resolve the problem, they can do it, give them enough time. But now we can more quickly get the SWAT team or the bomb squad, the bomb disposal squad there if it's needed more quickly, because we can sense what, it, I don't know if that analogy worked, but yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you understood, thank you. All right, so thermal mechanisms boost adaptive immunity. So we were just looking at innate immunity, but one of the reasons why it boosts adaptive immunity is because of that increased endothelial venule trafficking. It's going through the lymph nodes more, the killer T cells are able to become more specific to that antigen much more quickly um, because of that, and this just, the study was reflecting that that was that was true. Um, it enhances the rate of lymphatic trafficking across endothelial venules. Yep. All right. Sauna is comparable. There's a couple more slides here. Sauna is comparable to exercise. Probably should have put this one above. But if you think about it, you get when you get exercise, what happens? You get hot. All right. Very good. And so when you exercise, you're stimulating heat shock proteins, FOXO3 protein. Yep. Dilate to what, whatever muscle groups you're working. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you get hot, dilation of blood vessels. What else happens? Sweating. sweating, you sweat. That's really, actually, let me just go here. Sweating right there. Sweating facilitates higher excretion of some heavy metals, including aluminum, 3.75 fold compared to how much you eliminate in your urine. Cadmium, 25 fold, cobalt, seven fold, and lead, 17 fold. That, I, that was new to me. I didn't know to that extent you were excreting heavy metals. So sweating, obviously detoxing for a variety of things, getting rid of metabolic debris and byproducts. Yeah. But then even heavy metal. So yeah, heat therapy does that exercise. What else happens in exercise? Yeah. Fatigue and in a thermal therapy, you will get fatigued just because your body um, is, is working very hard. You're increasing the metabolism. Actually, I had a professor that once told me that doing a hyperthermia bath for uh, three hours or two and a half to three hours is the equivalent metabolically of running a marathon. So it's intense. So if you would like to rest after a marathon, you should rest after a hyperthermia bath or, or whatever thermal therapy you're doing, right? So yeah, a lot of the same benefits are the same. Where it differs is actual in joint mobility. You're not going to get the same synovial fluid uh, increased or, or flexibility of those um, of muscles and, and stuff like that. However, 
preconditioning in rats. I didn't finish this slide all together, but I just discovered this yesterday afternoon. They did a study where in mice and rats, they preconditioned them with a heat treatment. So they put them in, in, a, in a hot box for 19 to 20 minutes, very specific, um, 19 to 20 minutes, and then they caused them to exercise over 24 hours later. So this is quite a bit, uh, quite a ways down the road. Um, Jackie, tell me if I say anything wrong since you're really reading it, okay? So this is preconditioning. And the two groups, they did it several times. The mito So the damage that they suffered, they did whatever kind of exercise they had them do, whether running on a wheel, I don't know. Um, I don't remember. But they had less inflammation, less muscular damage, and, and in the mice that were exposed to the heat had more mitochondrial density. So they had more mitochondria even before they did the exercise. So they were much better. Um, do I have some numbers here? <sighs> no, I don't. Yeah, but it was it was incredible actually the difference. Actually, you can see right here. So look at this. That this is the 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 control group in the white, and then the and then the um, this is what heat shock proteins. So the level of heat shock proteins in the heated mice that were preconditioned with heat were way higher. And the heat was 24 hours prior. So this is, it's not like they, they were still warm. No, it's just the level of heat shock proteins that were in that environment. So if you've got a greater number of heat shock proteins, well then, yeah, you're going to be able to repair those cells better. You're going to be able to recover better. And so um, this, uh, and we know this from an athletic standpoint, sports science, um, athletes, uh, whether they know all this or not, they're doing that or the, Sport, uh, sports physicians are having their athletes do that. Precondition with heat, and then at the end, do a cold plunge or cold therapy uh, to reduce a variety of things. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, kind of like, let's say instead of you doing a heat therapy 24 hours before you do this exercise, you do small warm-ups, small exercises ahead of time, preparing like conditioning, getting ready for this big event of physical activity. Mm -hmm similar kind of thing. Absolutely. So that's really important from exercise science standpoint to warm up, warm up your muscles. Because I have a friend who was a boss of mine a while back, um, Ron Mott, some, may, some of you may know him, but he just, he did gymnastics as a kid. And then when he was 45 or close to 50, he went to do a cartwheel, what he could do, his brain knew he could do it. And he tore his Achilles tendon. He wasn't, he wasn't warmed up. The tendons, you know, fascia is very thixotropic. Fascia, muscle, thixotropic, which just means it becomes more extensible the more energy and thermal energy you apply to it. So it wasn't warmed up. So it's definitely important to warm up and just a little bit of exercise warms up your body, makes those muscles a little bit more elastic. Yeah. In, a, in the previous hydrotherapy um, class, we talked more about that, actually. Yeah. So, Morgan. Uh, I, I came here a little late. Um, you're already yep. It's online anywhere, but I can I can have I can email it to you the whole PowerPoint. Often, how I make a PowerPoint too is um I put the whole study in the notes, so it's there. <laughs> I put like it's like two pages worth of notes on that one PowerPoint. Yes. What's the difference between a wet sauna and a dry sauna? Very good question. Um, the short answer is you can sustain a higher temperature in a dry sauna because we looked at the thermal uh, the the thermal capacity of water, so it has a he high heat capacity and a high heat conductivity. So if you put yourself in a dry sauna, the air is not the best conductor of thermal energy, but water is a real good conductor of thermal energy. So if you have a sauna of 120 degrees that's dry, that's not going to feel very hot. It's just going to feel warm. But if you're in a um, water that's 120 degrees that's very hot you might even burn yourself with that so just conducts a lot more thermal energy so that's a good question because um you have to distinguish when you're reading these studies because they'll say it was 170 degrees well that's a dry sauna obviously because you can't sustain a, a wet you'd burn your lungs if because you're conducting that much thermal energy um into your body so uh so this is why um bring me back to another point uh this is why to get a lot of these benefits, it's actually better, but it depends. For a neurodegenerative standpoint and from a cancer standpoint, you really want to elevate the temperature quite a bit, the overall temperature, because cancer cells and pathogens and 
bacteria and viruses are thermally weak. Just the temperature itself is cytotoxic. So if you increase that temperature, your other cells are more robust. So that alone, without all the other things that we've talked about, it's going to. So if we can increase that temperature while protecting the brain, because neur neurons are, are sensitive, uh, more sensitive. Um, so if we're in a whole body sauna, which is great, very, very good, you can't last, you can't take it as long because your head is in that environment as well. But if there's a way we can apply thermal energy to the body with the head out, you can be able to have that sustain much longer. It obviously makes sense. Yes. I, I just want to uh, let everyone know that we are trying to record it. And so if you have a comment or a thought or a question, if you could just raise your hand yep. and wait for the mic so that people can hear us as they listen to it afterwards. Sure. And I'll try to repeat the question too. And I think I did repeat her question, but her question was, what's the difference between a wet and dry sun? You did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, I, I personally prefer a, a moist sauna, but there's certain conditions, respiratory conditions, where a dry sauna would be better. Um, but moist just because it's going to conduct a lot more thermal energy. Yeah. Um, years ago, Seth and I worked at Poland Spring Health Institute, was, mm -hmm. which was an Adventist um, lifestyle center here in Maine. Um, and we had steam cabinets. Yeah. So it was like what you're talking about, only your so, head was out. Yep. So you could get keep that heat for a longer period of time. This scientist, Ashley, PhD, and a couple other things um, and that I re referenced at UCS, UCLA, ah, whatever, um, she was like, when she discovered and researching these mechanisms, she's like, well, how can I create this the best? And she was going, she bought every kind of, you know, these sauna tents, these other things, these uh, heckles, heckles, really fancy instrument for heating, um, all these different things. And then she just came to a bath and <laughs> she just came back to a bath that had the head out of the water. And that was the most effective thing and very simple, but that was it. And they just have a, an attendant just there to keep the head cool. And you'll see that's what we're going to do. Um, so this is, horm this is an unfinished slide, hormesis, hormetic responses. That's really important. Um, but I was reading one study and this is the transition. I was reading one study and all sorts of great things, mechanism. Oh, that's a sweet mechanism. That's a sweet pathway. Oh, that's incredible. And then at the end it said, now, let, how do we apply this to cancer? And then they started saying, well, we're actively looking at ways that we can take the heat shock proteins and put them into a vaccine or take these things and put them into this and medication. And well, this whole study, you've just been mentioning how the body does it itself the whole time. And then now, just do that. Just continue doing that, what you're doing to the mice in your clinical trials and other humans. Just do that. But you need to make money off of it. Right? So they're trying to make these uh, mechanisms and pathways into some kind of medication. And, uh, and that, it was just kind of discouraging because all these beautiful pathways. And then now we're actively looking at ways we can make these functions go into a pill. It's like, uh, it's already happening. Yeah. So, so we can get those. So um, let's go ahead and maybe stretch a little bit and then we're going to transition to actually demonstrating dry a hyperthermia bath so now you have a in context of what all is happening inside the body but now how can you apply this to actually help somebody and prevent disease or help someone recover from an infection or recover from disease or at least palliative care so we'll go ahead and maybe we can stand up take some deep breaths Oh, feel the stretch and we'll just put a pause on, I don't know, the thing, or maybe we can do that after. It doesn't matter. Deep breaths, maybe big arm circles. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple jumping jacks, whatever you want to do. Big breaths. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, AJ. Actually, continue, continue stretching and continue chit-chatting. Don't go too far, but we're going to set up our little mock bathtub up here. <laughs> 